I don't typically go for sentimental endings, but if you throw a dog into the mix, well, then I'm a sucker like everybody else. If it makes you feel any better, the pooch who played Pard was actually Humphrey Bogart's dog, Zero. Just one more example of this film's spot-on casting. Although that's not Bogart's hand Pard is licking at the end. That belonged to Bogie's stunt double, Buster Wiles, who held a couple of doggy biscuits in his hand to ensure that Zero would give an avid performance. And that's also Buster Wiles taking the 90-foot slide down the mountain when Roy is shot. No computer tricks then. Wiles took the fall, staying face down the whole way so the camera wouldn't see that it wasn't Bogart. A net was just out of view in case he slid too far and went off the edge of the cliff. After Raoul Walsh yelled cut, Buster dusted himself off and told the director he didn't like a few of the bumps he'd taken. In true stuntman style, he asked if he could do it again. And Walsh told him, that's good enough for the 25 cent customers. Buster Wiles also played the sniper who shoots Roy Earl, a little inside joke by the filmmakers and one more example of the magic of the movies. For years, rumors went around that Bogart and Ida Lupino did not get along, and that they were openly antagonistic during the making of the film. Well, this nonsense was spurred by Warner's decision before the end of production to give Lupino top billing, something usually reserved only for female stars the caliber of Garbo and Dietrich. The studio was pushing High Sierra as one of its big A pictures of the year, and it felt that Bogart's B-movie persona might hurt the film's chances. He'd always been a heavy, remember, never a leading man. Well, Bogart was disappointed by the billing, but he didn't blame Lupino. In fact, they got along so well during filming that Bogart's wife at the time, the combative Mayo Method, joined the crew on location after she heard her husband was taking a shine to his spunky co-star. According to dialogue coach Irving Rapper, Bogart was crazy about Ida, and the feeling was mutual. It didn't turn out for us to be lovers, Lupino said later. She was married to actor Louis Hayward at the time, but we did care about each other. Being with him was absolutely heaven and peaceful to me, and I guess he didn't think I was too bad. Now, I'm sure that carrying her own water amongst hard-living, hard-drinking characters like Mark Hellinger, Raoul Walsh, John Huston, and Humphrey Bogart helped convince this feisty and talented 22-year-old that she had the stuff to one day take charge of a production the way these guys did. And sure enough, Ida Lupino would be directing, producing, and writing her own movies before the decade was over. To reiterate what I was saying at the top about the significance of High Sierra and the timeline of Hollywood history, the friendship that began on this film between John Huston and Humphrey Bogart would lead immediately to their making another movie together, The Maltese Falcon, which paved the way for the film noir movement in Hollywood. It's ironic that after being so dubious of Bogart's potential as a leading man that it barely showed him on the poster for High Sierra, the studio used images of him from this movie to promote the Maltese Falcon, released later the same year. That's how fast Bogart captured the public's imagination. His own studio was caught completely off guard. Bogart and Houston would go on to create other classics together, including The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, Key Largo, and The African Queen, and they'd remain best friends for the rest of Bogart's life. Houston's jovial working relationship with writer W.R. Burnett would eventually result in another classic caper, perhaps the greatest heist film of all, The Asphalt Jungle, coming to Noir Alley in several weeks. Um, not long after High Sierra was released, Mark Hellinger left Warner Brothers. He'd eventually get the production deal he'd always wanted at Universal, where he became one of the most influential producers of film noir. John Huston and Richard Brooks wrote the script for Hellinger's biggest hit, 1946's The Killers, which he followed up with such sensational films as Brute Force and The Naked City, for which he delivered the voiceover narration. Hellinger was all set to form an independent production company in partnership with Humphrey Bogart when he died of a massive heart attack at only 44 years of age. As Ernest Hemingway said of the hard-living Hellinger, 
death was always sitting on his shoulder. Now I invite you, as always, to share your thoughts about today's film on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed, where you can also find out about next week's picture, one of the oddest we'll ever present, Robert Montgomery as Private Eye Philip Marlowe in an adaptation of Raymond Chandler's The Lady in the Lake. Although you won't see much of the actor, since he decided to direct the picture using a first-person camera technique in which, essentially, you go through the whole movie in Marlowe's gummed shoes. Has to be seen to be believed. So, we'll see you then. <laughs>